This is a progressive story for a progressive age. It's the tale of how you can begin life as one thing, later transition into something else entirely, and then finally end up as something completely different than you started out as. I am of course referring to a car, the 2019 Toyota Yaris. I'm sure you guys guessed that though. Danny Boy here, and I kid you not. Now, I specify 2019 because this car that's sitting in front of you is actually the 2017 Toyota Yaris IA, but I'm gonna let you in on a secret. It's the same car. Before 2016, this was produced in Europe and Asia, and it was known as the Mazda 2. Yes, this is actually a Mazda underneath all the shiny Toyota badges. In 2016, Toyota started selling this car in the United States as the Scion IA. It was part of Toyota's youth brand, Scion. But then one year later, in 2017, Scion closed its doors for good, and Toyota started selling this as the Yaris IA, which is the one you're seeing here. So we've got a car that starts as a Mazda, becomes a Scion, is adopted into the Toyota family, but the world just isn't big enough for two Toyota Yarises. Yari? Yar Yari? And that's because in 2019, they're just gonna drop the IA altogether and sell this as the Toyota Yaris, which is really confusing because they're gonna sell it in tandem with, at least for a short time, the Toyota Yaris hatchback, which is a real car made by Toyota. And they're gonna sell this uh, under the same name. When this car isn't even made by Toyota, it's made by Mazda. In fact, let's play a super quick game. Find the Toyota badge on the Toyota car. Well, we've got the shiny Toyota badges on the front and back of the car. Okay, I see a little Mazda under the hood. Nope, that's Mazda. 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 I see Toyota on the windows. Oh, there's, nope, that's a Mazda badge. Oh, I know, under the floor mats. That is the only other place you will find the Toyota badge on this car. But maybe you're watching this video because you'd like to hear after a year of owning it, do I think it's a good car? And I'm just gonna spoil the end of the video for you right now. Yes, I think this is a great compact car for the city. If you don't live in a metropolitan city, you might wanna consider other cars. Here's why. The IA, as I'm going to refer to it, because it really is its own car, gets terrific mileage, it parks in pitifully small spots, and it's got Mazda Zoom Zoom in its DNA. Some good news about this car, it's got a very low curb weight, and that makes handling great. It's nimble, it really moves with you. When I turn the steering wheel, and the steering feels great on this car, by the way, it's smooth like butter, but it's firm, and it doesn't slip all over the place. It uh, gives you just the right amount of stick. You can tell that even though it's a small package, it's built real well. When you close the doors, it's got that solid Toyota thud. There's something about the way doors close on uh, non-domestic cars, on foreign vehicles. It's just, I don't know what it is. On the flip side, some of the panels feel pretty weak. Now, my mom owns a Toyota Camry, and the panels on that, they feel very nice and solid and metal. But when you get to the front quarter panels and the hood, there's something about it that as you push it, the metal bends with you. It doesn't really require much pressure at all, just a little bit, and it just kind of caves in. You can just tell that they were skimping a little bit on the metal here, and that it's, it's very thin. And partly because of those weaker panels when you're driving around on the highway or if you're ever driving through puddles in the rain or slush in the snow, there is quite a bit of road noise. You do feel and hear a lot of the thuds and the bumps that you go over. Something else this car lacks is a main cabin light, which usually goes in the middle of the headliner. It lights up the back seats, uh, but this car doesn't have one. And I guess I could get over that. The front passenger lights are bright enough that they light up the back seat. It's a tiny car. Something I cannot get over, and this is absolutely egregious, is the lack of of a glove box light. I, this is just insanity to me. I, I couldn't believe that there's no light bulb in the glove box. When it's dark and I'm trying to grab something out of the glove box, I cannot see what I'm doing for the life of me. And I had to put my own little light in there. I just hung it from one of the metal rods inside and it's better than nothing. Another interesting night only quirk is the display settings have an option to switch the system from day to night automatically, which makes it a little less bright, a little more bearable at night. Right now my headlights are off, which probably indicates to the car that I'm driving during the daytime. But if I turn them on, nothing changes. The lights come on outside, there they go, and nothing's changing. I drove this way for about two months until I realized that there's a small dimming dial right next to your speedometer that if you turn it one click to the left, there we go, it engages night mode and this is what it's supposed to look like at night. And in case you're an owner and wondering how to change the settings, if you switch the system to day, you can adjust the brightness and contrast for day and then when you switch it to night, then you can adjust the brightness and contrast for night. Once you have those settings saved, 
click system again, goes back to automatic. Now it automatically switches the brightness. You could see when I turn the headlights on and off. Other than the glove box light, the armrest in this car does not come standard. Without an armrest, your arm just falls down. It is a $200 optional piece of equipment that is absolutely mandatory if you get this car. The armrest does give you a small hidey hole for phones or music players, so there's an added benefit there. The navigation doesn't come standard, it is an option, but it can be installed through the insertion of an SD card. So instead of buying it at the dealership, it makes more sense to go on Amazon or eBay and buy a brand new SD card from a secondhand dealer and you'll get it for half the price. The rear headrests are also strange. When you sit in the car as a rear passenger, it's incredibly uncomfortable unless you move the headrests up to their normal position. You basically need to do this if you want to sit in the back. The annoying thing is that takes out all the visibility from the rear window. So when somebody's not there, you have to drop the headrests. And when somebody is sitting there, you have to raise them up. It's very strange, this little dance with the rear headrests. I've never seen this on any other car. Uh, here's one more hilarious quirk. When I purchased this car, this Toyota, the dealer told me that it came with Toyota Care, which is service every six months or 5,000 miles. It's the kind of service my family's Toyotas have always had. They told me when I went in for my first service that this vehicle is actually a Scion and gets service at Scion interval periods. Scion vehicles only get three factory services every seven and a half months or 7,500 miles. So basically they're trying to get me out of one service there, go from four to three, which frustrates me. Even the official factory warranty and maintenance guide can't make sense of this. Right here on page 36 of the maintenance log, it says Toyota recommends service every 7,500 miles or seven and a half months. Now that's the way that Scion vehicles are serviced, not normal Toyota vehicles, but turn the page in the same maintenance guide and here's where it got its serviced. Right up here it says 7,500 miles or six months and then it goes up by six month intervals but 7,500 mile intervals. It, it doesn't make any sense. And if you think that's all strange, know that the IA came in a variety of weird and extravagant packages available directly from Toyota. Buying this car could get you anything from an enchilada with Danny Trejo to a $24 million jet plane. I am 100% serious. But some other good things about the car, it's got lots of standard features for Toyota's entry-level vehicle, their subcompact car. It's got a backup camera, low-speed pre-collision system, it's got alloy rims, and although the IA is going to tell everyone that it sent it, you can send text messages hands-free from the IA. This is a feature not found on some of my friend's luxury cars. And probably one of the best things about the car is that it has a simple motor with no gimmicks. The motor and everything in the engine bay is very easy to work on. It's all right there for you to see. I'm not going to hide the fact that this isn't a sports car. I mean, I think now, unfortunately, that it has the Yaris name. There's no hiding that fact anymore. For what this car lacks in styling and high-end features, it really makes up for it practicality and usability. And that's why I say this is a great compact car for the city. If you live in one of those big cities and fitting in tight spaces is important to you, uh, not sucking down nine miles per gallon is important to you and getting you know 35 miles per gallon while sitting in traffic this car will give you those things it's a safe car it was a top safety pick of the IIHS I really don't anticipate any crazy maintenance issues or costly repair fees in the future I mean everything about this car is just very look at me this is who I am love me I hope this video helps you make a more educated decision. I'm going to leave you with one piece of parting advice, and that is if you do end up getting this car, be prepared to argue what the make actually is. And I'm going with Scion because the Toyota service department doesn't even call this thing a Toyota. Let people, let people wonder, let people ask you questions as to, let them, let them come up to you and say, what's Scion? No, but it's got Toyota badge on the front. Let them try to call it a Yaris and then laugh at them because the Yaris is a completely different car. It's not a Yaris, it's an IA. It's, it's so frustrating. Whatever.